Hello, and welcome to our panel on creating a responsive government. My name is Hannah Schenk. I am the Director of Strategy for Public Interest Technology at New America. Public interest technology is poised to make big changes at all levels of government. And today we have a great panel to talk about what it looks like to create a responsive government. Um, we'll discuss how grantees are helping government entities solve some of the most pressing human and societal problems and how other pit, practi pit, pit practitioners can duplicate and expand their work locally. Um, so on our panel today, um, we have Ashley Flabosher, <laughs> whose name I'm, I, I butchered, um, who is the Executive Director of the Davenport Institute for Public Engagement and Civic Leadership. She co-designed and serves as an instructor for the Professional Certificate in Advanced Public Engagement for Local Government and teaches a graduate level class on public engagement at the School of Public Policy. Um, Margaret Little is joining us from um, as the Director of Ethics of the Ethics Lab at, at Georgetown University. Um, Dr. Little is a Senior Research Scholar at the Kennedy Institute of Ethics and Professor of Philosophy at Georgetown. Her research interests include issues in reproduction, clinical research ethics, data ethics, which we'll touch on today, and the structure of moral theory. Latanya Sweeney, is a professor of government and technology in residence joining us from Harvard. Professor Sweeney creates and uses technology to assess and solve societal, political, and governance problems and teaches others how to do the same. One area, one focus area is data, data privacy and she is the director of the Data Privacy Lab in IQSS at Harvard. Professor Sweeney is an elected fellow of the American College of Medical Informatics and currently holds the privacy and security seat of the Federal Health Information Technology Policy Committee. And finally, Larry Suskind, the Ford Professor of Urban and Environmental Planning at MIT. Um, Professor Suskind's research interests focus on the theory and practice of negotiation and dispute resolution, the practice of public engagement in local decision-making, cybersecurity for critical urban infrastructure, entrepreneurial negotiation, global environmental treaty making, the resolution of science intensive policy disputes, renewable energy policy, water equity in older American cities, climate change adaptation, socially responsible real estate development, and the land claims of indigenous peoples. So today I would like to start our conversation um, by talking about what a, response, what a responsive government would look like. Um, so by definition, a responsive government requires the ability to quickly understand the ground truth. What is the lived experience that real people are going through? What do they need? And what does real help look like? But government lacks some of the very basic inputs that most modern decision makers have at their fingertips like easy access to real people's experiences, meaningful data, and also the ability to test solutions before first rolling them out. So asking government to completely overhaul the way it works sometimes seems a little bit like asking the sun to move four inches to the right. Where do we start and what role can pit practitioners play? Um, Ashley, I would love to start with you thinking about these questions. And I will say though, but please everybody, I would really like this to be a conversation. Um, we have so much brain power on this panel, um, and I would love to see uh, some some uh, interactions. So please feel free to jump in. But we'll we'll start with Ashley. So um, thinking about these questions from a Pitt UN perspective, as we prepare the next generation of policy leaders to think about public interest technology, many of them will be heading into organizations that don't know what Pitt is. So how do we help them navigate the reality that they're working against, or at least parallel to, established organizational culture? Yeah, that's a really important thing, I think, for us to consider. And the whole question of, of responsive government, I'll, I'll certainly, I think there are people who are more technologists than I am on this panel. Um, but this piece of how we connect the work of public interest technology with the culture of government, especially local governments, which vary widely across the country. Um, a lot of times when we're talking about this, we're also thinking of 
New York and LA, which in some ways have a lot more resources to bring to the table and in other ways have much more established kind of bureaucratic approaches to things. So I think that one of the ways we're approaching it at the School of Public Policy um, at Pepperdine University is to kind of take an inside outside lens to that and to focus both on introducing our MPP students, our masters in public policy students to public interest technology, helping them to feel more comfortable working with technologists, if not becoming technologists themselves, there's kind of both, both people come to us. Um, but then also giving them exposure to people who are actually practitioners in government right now and having some really honest conversations that help them set their expectations to the extent where they're looking at moving the needle. And, you know, we love the optimism and enthusiasm of our students, but also setting them up for a place where the first six months on the job is not terribly discouraging. So preparing them to navigate those very real bureaucratic structures is something that I think we forget about some of the time in in our, in our work. We get focused on the solutions and forget about where people will be navigating. At the same time, we focused outward to um, really think about how we offer professional development, professional education opportunities to current practitioners, to leaders um, in local government so that they have a better understanding now of how, how this technology can help them and hopefully a better understanding of how our students and others who are learning about public interest technology, that like those skills are actually something that they'll be looking for and that we're beginning to make some way there. So uh, that's obviously where our professional certificate program is really focused on that mid-career local government leader to try to help those who are moving up their career ladder understand this so that as we bring a new generation in, there's at least an understanding and appreciation of this while also preparing the, the new generation um, for the reality that there that that there's going to be a little bit, you know, it's going to look different to work with a local government than it would to work with a tech firm or or, um, or even within the education field, although we can lag too. Um, but I'd love to hear from the other panelists, kind of how they're thinking about this in their own work. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I'm I'm at Harvard, and we've had. A, a fantastic opportunity to really work in the space of public interest technology and sort of evolve a series of classes which, we, which the students call Save the World classes. And the classes and this work that the students have done have had profound impact both on business practice as well as on government. One of the, the, one of the reasons for that is we sort of take the take the, the notion of government and look at it in three different ways. One is the governance of technology itself. And two is government when government designs technology. And three is when government uses technology. And we have found that public interest technology has very strong voices to say to, in each of those areas. In the case of governance of technology itself, you know, we've had uh, um, Aran Kahana was a student who exposed vulnerabilities in Facebook, and Facebook responded by changing uh, the way it does things. Similarly, we've seen changes at Airbnb and at Google and in the government itself. So, when the government designs technology, we had Max Weiss who was able to show how uh, our idea of using public comments because the government had designed it. Uh, following the way they had always done it on paper, but this time just making a publicly available website, was vulnerable to robots infiltrating and making very real, using AI to make very realistic content and thereby distorting the public, uh, uh, what the government thought was public opinion. Since then, government has began taking changes. Our students were among the first to point out the problems in the voter registration websites. Um, and in 2016 and going forward. And of course, um, there's been a lot of work on the re-identification of data in the belief that data that's supposed to be anonymous isn't. And in terms of government uses of technology, this year we also had students who looked and assess the accessibility uh, to the American Disabilities Act of government websites and found them really quite inferior as well as security of government websites. I use that Libni because 
um, this has been very exciting. It's been exciting for the students to be able to roll up their sleeves and demonstrate a scientific fact that could have this kind of consequence and this kind of change in government. It's also been exciting to see government having to change and getting a scientific fact or scientific evidence on which it could take action. This work as a body gives us a new notion of what public interest technology, one vision of what a public interest technologist can offer. That is, when they're on the inside, when these students are hired and they're on the inside leading these kinds of policies or making these kinds of decisions, they have a much better way of looking for the unforeseen. So we realize that our view is only one view of public interest technology. It's a big umbrella and that's part of the excitement of it. And I'm sure my colleagues will give you others. Anyone else have anything else to add on that? Or I actually had a, so I think there's a, um, a question then, or at least there's a difference between having pit people on the outside and pit people on the inside. When they're on the outside, they're calling attention to, hey, this isn't working. Hey, this is broken. In some ways, that's maybe an easier life. <laughs> um, when they're on the inside, they are maybe have more power, but also, or they have more direct responsibility, but they don't really have the ability to like just go out and say, hey, oh, these 53 things are all broken. Um, so is the right approach, do we, do we need people on both ends of that? Do we need people from the outside and on the inside? Is there one that is, feels more promising? I can maybe speak to that. So what we're doing with the Pit UN initiative at Georgetown it is trying to get the people on the inside. So absolutely both are needed. But um, we know that uh, leaders in government, whether it's a state and local or the federal government, are at being asked to make decisions, whether it's State Department, DOD, um, or just working in a congressperson's office or a city council, that these folks are being asked to make decisions about whether to deploy certain technologies when there is a lack of ethical norms and consensus about when it's okay to do that. And, and, a, and a, the, the technologies move faster than our understanding of its potential social implications. So these technologies that have enormous potential for social good also have enormous potential for peril. And we're sending people out there in the government, asking them to make decisions without a lot of training in, in how to lead on this issue. So what we're doing is training early career folks, technologists and policymakers who, in our case, are headed out to work in the federal government. So uh, Ethics Lab, which is a, a unique team of philosophers and designers that works on ways of helping people be agile in approaching really challenging, challenging ethical issues, is working for uh, with the Center for Securities and Emerging um, uh, technologies at Georgetown to train uh, a, a cohort of fellows, CSET analyst fellows, Tech Congress fellows, and AAAS fellows, who are all about to be placed inside government early career jobs, and doing a series of workshops with them, putting them in real world scenarios where we help train them on the how to think ethically about these issues, not just um, what guardrails to understand, so that's important, but also again to, to really think in an agile fashion about how to spot problem areas, how to think about getting community consultation and other people's values into the mix of decision making. Um, one of the issues we talk about uh, in the workshops, Hannah, uh, are these issues you mentioned about when you are in the inside and you're being asked to do something or to make a decision you're not comfortable with. How do you navigate those waters? When do you speak up? What's the difference between calling people out, calling people in, being aspirational? Uh, when do you um, escalate and bring somebody else in? I mean, how do you start building moral conversations around these uh, really hard decisions? Um, so basically our effort is to um, help train the pipeline. People are gonna be asked to make really tough decisions that are suffused with ethical issues and give them practice before they hit the ground. If I, if I could, Hannah, uh, take a slightly different cut at this. Um, 
there's something about the question of cybersecurity that blurs inside and outside. Um, I'm, we have designed a cybersecurity clinic. We prepare students to work for cities and towns so that those cities and towns can analyze their cybersecurity risks and begin to organize to take action. Um, and the students include some who are going to likely go to work uh, on the tech side. I'm, a, I'm at MIT. Uh, I've got a lot of engineering students uh, who are interested in cybersecurity. And what they are surprised about is that the kinds of things that can help reduce the risk to cities and towns with regard to the risk to critical urban infrastructure are not uh, technical solutions. The sources of cybersecurity risk are the people in the agency who don't listen or who don't learn or who don't know that every single person is a source of risk. If you look at how cyber attacks occur, uh, how ransomware attacks occur in particular, uh, it's somebody opened an email from an untrusted source. And uh, now everything's been infected. And maybe like in Philadelphia or Baltimore or Atlanta, the whole systems are shut down. So the city can't deliver services to people. And it doesn't even have a way to communicate to the people from the agency that's been attacked that the agency is not able to help them. In the last few weeks, we have stories about hospitals being attacked with ransomware and people's lives being put at stake. So I'm trying to prepare people to understand how to, re to diagnose and manage the risks associated with cyber attack. Some of them are engineers and they need to understand that it's reverse social engineering, not encryption that's going to save that city agency. It has to teach people not to do the wrong things. It has to teach them the basics of cyber hygiene. It has to figure out what money to invest in backup systems, simple things that, and if you were teaching a public administration or public policy class, you'd say, oh, cybersecurity requires decisions by government decision makers, and they should uh, invest money in it. And they think that means IT. They don't understand that it means management and administration knowledge. And everybody who's going to work in city government needs to know this, whether they're a technologist or whether they're a policy administrator. The people who got stuck in Baltimore having to manage the attack were the assistant city council members and their staff. They, they, they were the ones who were told, we're under attack, what do we do? Well, they didn't have any kind of emergency action plan. They didn't have a disaster preparedness effort. And in the middle of all this, certain neighborhoods are disproportionately hurt because in this case, all the water was shut down. The, the water systems are gone and they have supposed to fix it. It's not that they go to the engineering department, they said to the city council and the staff, we have to do something, people don't have water. We can't run the systems because we've lost control of the management of the system and we don't know if the water quality is okay. So we have to shut it down. Now, my point is we need to be teaching people, whether they're technologists or whether they're policy oriented people about how these complex systems work and what it means when there's a technology involved, in this case, the information system being attacked and that being able to take action means engaging all the parts of the system simultaneously. The only way we teach that is with a clinic. We don't teach about it. We teach students to do it. We prepare them and we put them out in cities that want to be clients of the clinic and the client community says, help us. And we say, well, first we have to prepare students for six weeks. They, whatever their background, they have to take six week online course, intensive training in cybersecurity risk assessment. And then for the next seven weeks, they're assigned in teams of three to work for different cities and towns. And by the end of the semester, they understand why it is so hard for cities to do simple things to reduce their cybersecurity risk. They learned all the technical stuff in the first six weeks, but they also learned about working with 
a community, not just the technology side, not just the political side, but both. So I think the university needs to be producing um, smart people from both who are going to work inside and outside, technologists, non-technologists. And the only way I know to teach them is to put them in a kind of clinical moment where they have to do what you say they're going to be prepared for, but do it while they're a student, learn by doing it, which means we need clinical educational um, ideas, clinical educational strategies for teaching about public interest uh, technology. I know. Um, so that just makes me wonder, um, and sort of broadening that out, whether we're teaching about cybersecurity or we're teaching about data ethics, for example, um, you're, you're preparing students to exist in a world that doesn't, that isn't here yet. Um, or maybe it is, but it isn't. It's a lot of unknowns. Um, we don't know when the next cyber attack is coming. We don't know how people are going to misuse data. Um, we can guess, um, but we can only make a guess based on maybe what has already happened in the past. It's probably pretty hard to make a guess about what's going to happen in the future. Um, so as we think about creating a more responsive government, a piece of that is preparing people for the world that they're going to be inhabiting when we don't really know what that looks like. Um, and I want to focus specifically on the data ethics piece. Um, so at the moment, um, because the use of data in government is pretty new, and frankly, in the world, it's pretty new. Um, at the level that we're seeing, um, it is, it, we're still wrapping our minds around what it can do. Um, and so I recently met with a team who is doing amazing things with cell phone data, um, but it also gets creepy really fast. Um, so Latanya, I would love to hear your thoughts on how do we navigate evangelizing, evangelizing the use of data in government while also ensuring that it's used in a thoughtful way um, that doesn't move into the creepy realm or worse? Well, well I mean, first of all, the, the revolution of data, data is becoming its own kind of currency. And it's clearly uh, an incredible component in the future of decision-making because it allows us to make better policy decisions when we're on the inside, because we sort of have scientific and evidence for a lot of the programs and so forth that, that get pushed out right now. Uh, right now, a lot of programs, for example, are pushed out and we, we wanna know whether or not that program was any good. We, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have really good ways of doing that. So there's a need, need for government itself to want data. There's a tremendous flood of data happening. And the, the issue of individual rights and, and, and privacy versus uh, their obligations to society and whether or not society will protect it and to when does that turn into surveillance is frankly, uh, has frankly been the conversation of privacy uh, since, the 19, since the 1970s. And we haven't really come to grips with that at a point where data is becoming more and more critical. Um, I do think it's, uh, I do think that is a fundamental question, sort of the idea of an economy, this data economy, what will it be? The, you know, click in, uh, sort of click through agreements and all of the things that has led us to here clearly are not really effective as we go forward. And the design of technology and the practices that we've allowed with data have eroded many of our historical protections. So a lot of the kind of unforeseen uh, examples that the students, that our students bring forward continue to shock us and begin to shape us into realizing we really do have to take, take ownership of this. So I'm not answering your question by giving a, an answer of this is the way forward or the solution. But I am answering your question in the sense of saying that public interest technology, the development of it, is critical to, a fu to our future. Can I jump in a little bit here and say that this is one reason why I think this is a really important conversation to be having in the university setting, um, because this is, 
it's kind of the difference between talking about solutions, talking about government, even talking about policies and talking about governance broadly. And I've been really, it's been really interesting just listening to each person bringing different lenses, even to this conversation, whether it's the ethical lens and we're really having deep questions about what is ethics at an individual level, at a societal level, there is a philosophy conversation to be had there. And it's a conversation that needs to be robust and that goes well beyond data, right? Data does not get us we, there is, we can use data ethically or unethically, but data is not going to teach us ethics. And so there's that conversation that needs to happen. There's the cybersecurity conversation and the connecting students to practice and the, the, the sort of understanding, there's a sociology piece of this, of how do we actually behave, a human behavior element of it. There's a, again, the policy and governance, what actually, what makes for strong communities, not just what makes for good solutions, but what makes for strong communities. And I think all of these pieces are things that the university, having these conversations within the context of the university, allows us to bring these lenses together in really important ways to where we are looking at data, but we're not just looking at data. We're also looking at it through these different lenses and we're bringing the, the human elements of these conversations. And, um, Unlike Margaret, we're working with local governments and, and a big piece of this is also just the practical conversation of what works and what actually, like, how do you match a tool with a solution? And we see that in the local government field all the time. Part of the reason we started to get involved in this is that we realized that the local leaders we were working with, all of the training they were receiving was coming from vendors. And the vendors are great and they have really interesting information, but they're also trying to sell a product. And so having that broader conversation, I think that's where the university can bring so many disciplines to bear on this conversation so that it's not just a conversation about technology, but it's a conversation about how technology fits in with our experience of living together in community as human beings. And I think that's really important for us to not lose in, in the conversation and, and, and that, that everything I'm hearing from Latanya, from Larry, from Margaret is just really highlighting that for me right now and even your questions, Hannah. Yeah, if I could add in, I, I love the way Ashley just put that, the, the importance of the academy. And part of the importance of the academy is coming up with new theories, new uh, doing R&D on, on technology. But part of the importance of the academy is when it can work with folks outside the academy as partners, right, shoulder to shoulder. So industry, government, um, uh, civic society groups. And the issue around data ethics is absolutely fascinating, is going to get ever more complicated. Questions as um, Latanya mentioned about privacy. So do we have the right to use or often reuse uh, data that might never have been meant for the purpose we're using it for now? Um, issues about uh, even if we have the right to use the data, are the tools we're building with the data um, unintentionally uh, reinforcing biases and social injustice because of, of how the uh, data, uh, um, biases in the data themselves or in the AI or machine learning analytics, analytic tools we're building because we're not paying enough attention to social justice while we're designing them. But also issues around, somebody mentioned the idea of, of the public and community. So one of the biggest issues that Ethics Lab works with a lot of partners trying to work on how you design data ethics solutions for privacy, how you design data ethics solutions from the ground up uh, for social justice. And again, how you design them for preserving the public trust. So if, if we think about the context, for instance, in uh, public health, right, very active right now with the COVID-19 conversations, groups all over the globe are working to try to leverage new data, organic novel data sources and new analytics on data to help uh, drive prevention strategies. How do we decide where the virus is gonna be hitting? How do we apportion scarce preventive resources? Really important. We wanna make sure we preserve privacy when we do that. We wanna make sure we don't have unintentional discrimination so that, that people don't have equal access to these critical benefits. But we also have to pay attention to preserving public trust in the tools that we use. Because sometimes some of our most powerful tools are ones that involve black box technology, right? Where we can't explain why we have the predictive analytics we do. And if there's one lesson people have talked about in public health, it's that uh, public trust is hard won and easily lost. And if you don't have it, you have nothing. 
right? Which not to comment too much on our current state of the world, but boy, is that true, right? If we lose trust, we've lost a lot. So the importance of people working on data solutions and data analytics solutions, understanding that they're ethical stewards of privacy, justice, and trust is really critical. So, I, would, okay. I, I would just like, I, and I like to tease that and pull it in a slightly different direction. Um, and that is, and that is the, the issue so what creates a lot of the vulnerability, so we, we have a whole modeling and uh, curriculum that around how to figure, find the unforeseen. How do you figure it out? How do you put a scientific fact around it? But one of the issues that's particularly important on the inside for government, the government's not good at, is teasing away when a very successful technology, a very successful use of data is inappropriate for its use in government. So this, this really came up in both the conversation that Ashley and Margaret brought up because uh, we industry is working and moving and developing great new technologies, but whether or not they're actually appropriate to be used in a particular setting is a totally different conversation to have. I would say about a third of the vulnerabilities that our students point out each year fit in that category where the shiny new technology is automatically deployed but yet it has a consequence that was not foreseen. And the consequence, because it's government, is overwhelming, is shocking, and shocks one's conscious, and therefore becomes disruptive. So I do think that part of public interest technology is, close, is, is actually filling that gap, whether you're coming to it from the kind of lens that Ashley talked about, or the kind of lens that Margaret talked about, or Larry, all, any person engaged in these programs, we're all pushing in this kind of knowledge in different kinds of ways with different kinds of pieces because it's such a broad area. But at the end of the day, those are the kinds of holes I do think we're all feeling. Can I um, also try to build on Ashley's point about the, the role of the academy? Um, and, and put a finer point on it. Um, my sense is when we talk about corporations, we expect them to have a statement of corporate social responsibility. But very few universities have a statement of their corporate. So they're not for profit, but or some of them, but they, very few have a published statement of what their social responsibilities are. I believe they should. And within that statement, when we're talking about in public interest technology or data or data gathering or research, um, we uh, teach what we call uh, and others call participatory action research, PAR. And you can Google it and somebody listening and study what that means. But basically it says, if you're gonna mess around in a place, whether it's at a sc whatever scale, that the people in the place are not just partners in the sense that they're gonna receive the work that you've done. They are partners in the decision about what questions to ask, how to answer them, how to interpret the first cut at the information that you've gathered, what to formulate by way of prescriptions from that work. And if we don't ex say that it's part of the university or the academy's social responsibility to engage partners in a way that really it allows them to participate and share in making decisions, then I'm very worried that the outcomes and the products will not reverse the kind of unfairnesses and social inequities that, we're, that are already in place. They'll just reinforce them. And my feeling is that just because we're working with data and technology doesn't mean that the research that we do shouldn't be undertaken in a par-like fashion. This is a really um, interesting conversation and not necessarily the direction I thought it was going to, uh, we were going to go, but I am reminded of um, a conversation I had maybe a year ago with um, somebody who was an, um, an AI academic for a long time who is now has been in the private sector at one of the big places um, for maybe 10, 15 years. Um, and 
he was making the argument that one of the big problems with something like Twitter or Facebook is that those were not incubated in the academic world first. So there wasn't a real understanding of what they could do. Um, and that that would have come out had it had those been uh, pro academic projects. I'm curious if that resonates and if there that feels like there is um, a, a pit application. Well, I'll, I'll jump in being a computer scientist. I, I, um, I don't think that I, I would push back on that perspective that the that the academy would have led us into a different plot. It's, it has to do with what are the questions being asked and whose obligation is it to do the asking and what are the tools they have to enforce the answer. Each of those companies have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders. At the end of the day, that's what business means. And those are, at the end of the day, they can make claims about their social responsibility, but when it clashes with their business model, when uh, things really do change. I saw that in my own work with, when uh, um, I did the work that sort of pioneered, was the first work on the uh, unfairness of algorithms to show that if you typed in a name given more often to a black baby than white baby in a Google search bar, you got these ads implying the person had an arrest record, even if they didn't, and even if no one with that name had an arrest record. And I remember notifying the company, which was one uh, who was featuring the ads, uh, who is a large company who you would think would be responsive, not going to do any evil in the world, and we would expect them to be equally surprised. But actually, action didn't happen until the news went around in the media and got to uh, the business press, and then action happened. And we saw the same thing with Facebook when Iran did the uh, show to, uh, how uh, Facebook Messenger leaked GPS locations, and he built a plug-in that showed where you could view friends and friends of friends locations. Again, shocking the conscience. Again, we didn't see Facebook take action until, uh, and, until it became a part of their business issue. I use these examples not because I'm claiming that, uh, that when we do disruptive work that that's, that's, that's somehow better. It's not better. What we really want, we want the companies to be responsive. We want government to be responsive. We want them to be responsive early. But to think that, um, but to think that somehow if they had been a project coming out of academia, it would have been different, I don't think is true. Because at the end of the day, when they cross over to have to have that fiduciary responsibility, at the end of the day, that's what's going to drive. You might push back just a little bit. I think I, I agree with like 90%, but I want to maybe push back on the 10%. So I, I also agree that um, it's a little overstated to say, oh, if only things were incubated in the academy, all would be well. <laughs> the academy has its own problems and of, of poor representation and only a one slice of society that, that we're all familiar with. W what I think is potentially the, the, the broader insight that your friend Hannah was gesturing toward is if we incubate new ideas in a seemingly value neutral setting, if we think that all we're trying to do is um, uh, move fast and break things, that, that that's the way to make innovation happen. There's a culture about what's okay that can get started that's really problematic. And the only piece I would push back from the way that Latanya was pointing, putting it is, it, it's one thing to say most, many, many corporations will, um, are, uh, may not live up to their ethical obligations. That's true of many people too, right? But, but I wouldn't say that because they have a fiduciary responsibility to their stockholders that they don't have the moral responsibilities, right? So uh, business ethics were, you have fiduciary responsibility to your stockholders, but that are limited by being a good agent. And that's not merely being compliant with law because law often isn't keeping up with the potentials of the things you yourself have created. So we, we want to have um, innovation that is uh, developed with a socially responsible mindset that doesn't have to mean you can't make profit, but it does mean you have obligations beyond merely profit maximization. Um, and to me, one of the really fascinating uh, and important uh, goals of the PIT-UN 
initiative is to is to start is to try to inculcate even more the idea that um, innovation needs to have that kind of mindset and to start asking questions about how we develop it. Yeah, let me plus one, Margaret, uh, for for pushing back a little bit on my sweeping statement. And one of the best examples of what you just said, you do see this change of thinking. Uh, in companies, Airbnb, I think, is a fantastic example of the exact opposite. When faced with the same kind of exposed kind of unforeseen consequence, because a lot of it's unforeseen, and so to the extent that it could be foreseen, then we should we could help them make it foreseen. But when it's unforeseen, it's in the marketplace. It's kind of late, and you and and you end up in this disruptive cover yourself kind of reaction. But Airbnb didn't take that action. They've really been amazing. They've stepped up. They've led. Uh, new research within the organization itself to make sure that they fight bias on their platform. And they, they are to be commended. So they do set as an example that it's not always just profit driven. Yeah, if I can jump in just a little bit in terms of the university's responsibility um, and the place to incubate things. I think one of the challenges, and I do think that there are opportunities to what Latanya said for more research and a more academic lens to potentially help see some of the forcing consequences, right? There are consequences that are often unforeseen that if we'd done a bit more research, we would have foreseen. But I also think it's important to note that technology change, it, it is sort of iterative as it goes and the ways that we use technology, and this is a human question, not necessarily a technology question, the way that we end up using them changes as we go. And so I think about, I actually think Facebook is a great example of this. Um, I'm the Facebook generation. I had my first Facebook page when it was when you could only have it with a .edu email address. It wasn't incubated in the university as a university project, but in some ways it was incubated in the university as a student project. And at the time, what Facebook was designed for was to be a way to stay in touch with the people you went to school with and to build your professional network with those people so that as you moved on, you'd stay connected. And it very quickly, as soon as they opened it up to a more public base, it shifted dramatically in terms of how we actually used it. And in some ways, you know, I still have friends from college that I do keep in touch with via Facebook. And it still is the way for, for the thing that it was originally designed to do, it still does that decently well. What it wasn't designed for, but, it, but adapted into um, was this whole platform of sharing information, of sharing news, of sharing opinions of connecting more broadly to people we don't know, all of these things. Um, and I mean, we can argue about how much people saw or foresaw, but I think the, the point that I wanna make is that te technology and the way we use technology adapts um, as we use it. And so I think one of the key things that we need to do and one of what it sounds like all of us are doing in the various projects is helping the people who will be using this technology, whether it's in government or sort of alongside government as watchdogs, have the right set of questions and the right set of ethical lenses so that whatever the technology is that's released as it adapts and as it changes, which it will and the way we use it will, when those truly unforeseen consequences come up, that they have a framework in which to respond to that. That's beyond cybersecurity. Um, more in terms of how we use and, and, and some of the broader ethical uses of things that if people start using something in a different way, we have a sense of how to respond to it. Um, and I think that goes back to the whole governance question that we are, we are helping to prepare people for the difficult job of governance, not just the technical use of policy or the implementation of policy or these different things. Uh, so I want to take the opportunity just to, we have um, a little under 15 minutes left, and if um, we would love to take questions from the audience, if anyone has a question for one of our panelists, just please put it into the chat box. Um, and I want to um, bring it back to something that we sort of vaguely touched on, but not fully. Um, so Larry, your work focuses on negotiation and consensus building. Um, and bringing that to the pit space, much of your work is out identifying relevant stakeholders for public decisions and then finding ways to help these groups work collaboratively with government. Obviously there is 
some huge overlap here in the conversation we were just having. Um, so when we talk about shaping organizations to take a pit approach to problem solving, one critical piece is being able to have a deep understanding of what the public needs. How can we build the capacity of the public to engage in collaborative decision making? Thanks. It, it's much more complex than I could uh, explain or begin to answer in, in two minutes. But um, if you think about the, the moniker of smart cities, right, we have all over the world efforts to employ new kinds of technologies, information technologies and others to um, ensure that what's happening in the city is immediately noted or that people can put their concerns in and that will allow city governments and city government agencies to be more responsive. So the presumption is that participation means uh, information back to the system so that your needs and interests can be met. But the system that's responding is designed by policymakers and by decision makers and unless we have a, a different layer, a meta layer of engagement of stakeholder groups in the city, let's say at that scale, to help formulate the policies and design these institutional structures, then sending messages back to smart city sensors saying, oh, there's a hole in the road, uh, and then that we should send the truck and fill the hole, doesn't mean that the transit system's gonna be designed in a way that's fairer or more efficient, because policy decisions need to have engagement. And we can use different kinds of technologies to support the engagement of not just large numbers of people, but categories of stakeholders who can work collaboratively, not just separate lines of information flowing back, sum it up and tell the system what to do, but to engage in policy deliberation with stakeholders representing large segments of the community that make the systems capable or not capable or inclined or not inclined to respond to what the technology of smart cities is sending back by way of information. And my feeling is that those of us interested in public interest technology should be talking about how to use some of it to ensure that the policies in the first place are made collaboratively and more responsively and more fairly. And it's different technologies. It's not sensors sending back information. It's uh, uh, online channels through which deliberation, face-to-face -face deliberation can happen. And, uh, and it's, a, it's a portion of, um, uh, of, of smarter technology for collaborative decision making, not just information gathering that makes systems of cities more efficient that I think we should be working on. And I think this raises a really interesting, um, important point that we hadn't quite touched on yet, which is incorporating human voices into policy making, and that there is, you know, in, in PIP, Technology is in the name and we talk a lot about technology, but technology is very much a tool um, of, of, of that can be used for policy making um, or for uh, policy implementation, but it is not necessarily the tool. Um, so I think that that is um, worth saying again and again and again. <laughs> um, other thoughts? I would just to jump on what you just said in that about, um, and I know that technology can be a really great benefit for those human conversations. Um, one example that I come back to, uh, which is somewhat dated now, but kind of demonstrates where local government was at in, in, in large amounts of ways still is that we work with the city of Yale in California right after a huge scandal. Um, it was national news. If you haven't looked at it, look at it, it should be, it should be a movie, basically like a mafia red city. Um, and one of the things that I really appreciated for, from them is they use, sorry, I'm saying that my feedback is bad. Let me, let me pause and let someone else talk. Uh, 
Um, so uh, while we wait for Ashley to um, work out the audio. Uh, oh, technology. <laughs> <laughs> the unforeseen issues of technology. Case in point, and the question is, do we produce people who are nimble enough to recover from it and, <laughs> and root it well enough in the circumstances that, the, that in the reaction, they'll navigate us in the right direction? Ashley's back. <laughs> oh, not yet. Okay. Um, and I will just put out one more call um, for the for questions from the audience. We are um, closing in here on um, just a, another ten minutes. Um, Ashley, do you think you're back, or should we push push on? You're good. Hold on. Am I, can you hear me? Yeah. Is that sounding okay? All right. I was just going to say, um, we worked with uh, the city of Bell um, after this scandal. Look it up. It's fascinating. Um, but they wanted to do public conversations. These are in-person conversations, low-tech conversations um, around some budget prioritization after essentially um, there has been so, so much corruption in the city. And the reform government, the new government that was elected, the new government that came on, the new city manager, worked with uh, a tech platform called OpenGov, which many local governments are familiar with now, um, but that just did data visualization. It basically did budget visualization where you could look back over the years, how money had been used, how funds had been used, and, and also do some projections. And it was visuals. This is a very ethnically diverse community, um, not really an ethnically diverse community, just a very non-white community, a very, a very um, highly Latino community, a lot of people who English was not their first language, but being able to see the visuals, being able to see the graphs and charts, being able to kind of have conversations in English and Spanish because we use uh, dual, we use simultaneous translation technologies, um, help these in-person conversations to be had in a way that built trust with the community um, in, in a way that it would have been almost impossible. If we'd printed things out and showed it to them, people would have still guessed, just been suspicious. And being able to have this third-party platform with all of the information that helped guide the conversation, along with the translation tools that helped um, a, a, a dual language community have the conversations together was super powerful. So I just wanted to note that, that the in-person, the community building piece and the technology piece sometimes can be integrated in really interesting ways um, beyond what we think of when we're thinking of technology kind of broadly and data and all of this stuff to make decisions. Yeah, I, can I just say one thing? We, it, at first glance, and Ashley reminds us that we're not about technology bashing. I mean, it's in fact a belief that our future and technology go hand in hand as to how do we make sure that it leads us in the right direction and that we become the benefactors of it and not be victimized by it. A lot of our work has really pointed to democracy itself being up for grabs as we looked at the kind of problems that we're seeing getting bigger and bigger in terms of our ability to execute our rights and, uh, and, 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 and and ensure our government. And it just seems so critically important that we pursue public interest technology right now. Um, and I, I'd like, I wanna to add to that, that um, there was an essay recently um, that talked about radical um, responsiveness in government, um, which where radical responsiveness was defined as um, reacting, government reacting to things as they are, not as we would like them to be. Um, and public interest technology is a huge piece of that. Um, it almost like, you know, was flashing lights to public, public interest technology as I was reading it. I don't know if anyone else saw that, but I thought radical responsiveness, um, just as basically being tell the truth um, was a great, is a great uh, catchphrase. Um, I just want to be sure that when we talk about public interest technology, we don't just slide immediately to the discussions of the technology. Uh, it is not obvious what public interest means in a democratic context. Um, and my sense is 
that if you bend it back the other way and said, how can the technology help us understand what the public interest is in a particular context? That's a different mission. It's not, you know, and, and my feeling is that the essence of the public interest has got to be the product of deliberation, dialogue and deliberation, not just counting what people think they want at a point in time. People should have a chance to con educate each other and convince each other. And so my, my concern is that public interest technology emphasize how is, what's the public interest and how can we know it better with technology, not just as a label to put on the technology so we can go about doing our technology work. Yeah, that's such an important point. Um, so with our remaining two minutes, we did get a few questions in. Maybe we can just do a really quick speed round on the, uh, the la on one of the questions. Um, so uh, what excites you about the possibilities of technology with regard to government? Well, I, I'll go first. I expect uh, right now we live in a new kind of technocracy where the rules of technology determine how we live our lives. I think it's through public interest technology that we can make sure that our democracy gets restored. Um, Ashley? Yeah, I'll say one of the things that I'm excited about, my work is in the dialogue and deliberation field. And I think that often gets off track. I'm actually really interested in just how technology can help improve basic government processes. So sort of the, the customer experience with government because that takes up so much of people's uh, time and energy and making sure that that as technology helps us do a better job with that customer experience, it can allow us to have more space and room and even emotion for um, the citizen. And I use that word broadly, not meaning not in a legal phrase, but, but in that place where we have ownership and we have investment and we have discussion, I think it creates more space when we're not just frustrated because how in the world could they not have told me that this was the form that I needed 18 phone calls ago, which is often, I think, what most people's first interaction with government still is. If we um, emphasize that dialogue deliberation using technology is going to be key to making democracies work and not just letting them fall into, as Latanya says, becoming technocracies um, for because the technology demands it as opposed to the other way around, then I think there's a role for a facilitator of the collaborative conversation using more advanced technologies. And I think all of us in the university settings that we're in can talk about training people to be facilitators okay of substantive public policy dialogue at every scale using the technology to achieve the consensus or informed agreement to the extent possible in the dialogue. So not people to make the technology only, but people to facilitate the use of the technology. And boy, do they need to be aware of and skilled in a variety of disciplinary capabilities. Um, and Maggie, let's uh, let's end on you with a. Well, I I am extremely excited about the power of technology to advance the common good. I mean, when I think of advances, I mean, just how technology has helped us with COVID. You know, we wouldn't have uh, made the incredibly rapid progress on vaccine and therapeutics without new data solutions driving it. So there's enormous potential here, um, and you you just have to. You know, you have to balance the promise with the responsibility that comes. And I completely concur with this panel that a key part of that responsibility is actually designing it around, I don't even want to call it the end user, it's designing it around us, right, and the common good. Thank you. I just want to thank all of you for a really excellent discussion on a rainy Friday. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.
Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, this is the professional development panel where we're going to be talking to some challenge grant winners from 2019. And the title of the panel is Collaborating and Learning as a Pitt Educator. Uh, my name is Effie McLaughlin. I am an assistant university dean for research at the City University of New York. And um, my entry point into the, the Pitt UN uh, movement conversation, which I'm going to ask all of our, um, our speakers, our panelists today, is mostly from a professional development, faculty development, sort of research development perspective. I'm really interested in faculty engaging with these ideas and also developing research projects around these ideas. So I hope we'll get a, a, a bit of a chance to talk more about that. Um, and also, <laughs> as David Gustin started us out with yesterday on a personal note, my greatest technological challenge, my grand challenge today was getting, I, have, I live in New York City and I have three daughters who are in the New York City public school system who are all go to different schools and all have different, um, uh, they all have different online and remote learning schedules and, and, and was, my biggest challenge today was getting them out of the house so I could have uninterrupted bandwidth time to conduct this panel in. So um, I know that some of our um, panelists today or some of the moderators today, um, you know, basically read out the bios from each one of the speakers, but I'm actually really much more interested the, the way that I would like to start out. And I'm going to introduce each one of you in turn, but I'm basically just going to say your name and your affiliation. And what I'd really like you to say is, um, you know, say whatever you think is important about your professional experience that brought you to uh, the Pitt UN meeting today. And then also because probably not a lot of the attendees today had an opportunity to view your, your poster session video. So if you could give really just a very brief um, statement about what your project was, and I'm going to try to keep this short. I already had a conversation with Mahmoud about this, but we're going to try to stick to the time as much as we can. So please try to keep it at, at two minutes. And I will, uh, if I have to break you in for time, I guess I will. But I, so I'm going to start out with, I'm just going to go in the order that they were on the, um, in the program. So I'm going to start out with Dr. Kenneth Fleischman, who is the associate professor in the School of Information at the at University of Texas at Austin. And he's also the founding chair of Good Systems at UT Grand Challenge, as you see behind his head. Um, and his project was the 2020 Conference on Undergraduate Informatics Education. And Ken, if you could just say, as I said, a little bit about yourself, um, what brought you to the Pitt UN movement, and just say a, a very a brief overview of what your project was. Awesome. Thank you, Effie. Um, I should mention, sorry, the website information was out of date when the program was made. So I've been promoted since to professor in the school. Ooh. Very Texas and Austin, sorry. Um, but um, yeah, so I'm really delighted to get to be here with uh, such esteemed colleagues from across uh, the uh, Pitt UN universities. So um, in the School of Information, we focus on the intersection between people, information, and technology, but we always put people first. So the our iSchool, as many other iSchools do, um, builds upon and extends a tradition of service to users that comes from our roots and continued efforts in the field of librarianship. But we now expand that to a broad range of information technologies, some of which are still contained within libraries, archives, and museums, and some of which go far beyond. So as part of that effort um, in the UT Austin School of Information, we're launching an undergraduate major in informatics. Um, we have six concentrations, cultural heritage informatics, health informatics, human-centered data science, social informatics, social justice informatics, and user experience design. And so uh, when we learned about the exciting opportunities at Pitt UN and the, the range of, of different universities and colleges, uh, all getting together around this common vision of ensuring that technology serves the public interest, it fit perfectly for our iSchool, it fit really well for me. My um, background is truly interdisciplinary. So I was an undergrad CS anthropology double major. Um, and then I moved to the field of science and technology studies where I got my master's and PhD. And then I've been living in high schools ever since. Um, so uh, we were able to organize by just barely because it was March 2nd to 4th. Um, so just immediately before everything shut down, uh, informatics education 2020 in the city of Austin. Um, at the campus of the University of Texas, Austin. 
So the collaborators on the uh, project um, within the UT Austin School of Information, Amelia Acker and Eric Meyer, our dean and also our uh, Pitt UN um, representative, uh, designate, and um, also from the University of Michigan School of Information because um, we were two, uh, you know, top I schools within uh, that that have that same tradition of of librarianship, but taking far beyond. And you know, so that included uh, Pat Garcia, Casey Pierce, and Kentaro Toyama from University of Michigan School of Information. So we're able to bring together faculty members and and students from thirty different universities, uh, ten of which are current Pitt UN members, 20 of which might be future Pitt UN members. And there were a lot of, actually Eric got a lot of questions because he's also chairing the membership committee about um, you know, how to get their provost or president to join Pitt UN. So it spurred a lot of interest in Pitt UN in general and it created a lot of information exchange. And then most, the last thing I'll say about it most specifically, it led to uh, a project that we're doing for the this coming year, um, which is the, uh, Pitt UN Social Justice Informatics Faculty Fellows Program, which is a collaboration with Houston Tillotson University, which is the oldest university in the city of Austin. It's also uh, HBCU, um, as well as with uh, Measure and Capacity Catalyst to social justice oriented nonprofits and the city of Austin, as well as UT Austin School of Information, uh, Good Systems, UT Grand Challenge. And um, we're going to have faculty fellows from across Houston Tillotson and University of Texas at Austin, learning directly from and with our nonprofit and government partners about what it means to do public interest technology. Thanks. Great, thank you. I'm now gonna move on to Dr. Mahmoud Farouk, um, who is the Associate Director of the Consortium for Science, Policy and Outcomes based in Washington, DC. And he's also a clinical associate professor for the school for the Future of Innovation in Society um, at part of Arizona State University. And his project was Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Fellowship. Please, Dr. Fruit. Hello, uh, thank you, uh, Ethi, for the introduction that saved me from telling who, who I am. Uh, I, my work mainly focuses on uh, two questions. One question is, how do we make science more useful? And the other one is how do we make science and technology more democratic? So oh. it's, the, it's the democratic part that brings me to Pitt UN. And uh, it's a pleasure to give a brief overview of the Public Interest Technology Community Innovation Fellowship Program that uh, we launched with the help of our grant. So this fellowship program is a partnership between ASU-led Expert and Citizen Assessment of Science and Technology, or ECAS network, and the Association for Science and Technology Centers, or ASTECs. So ECAS is a network of university science centers and nonpartisan think tanks that engages public on science and technology decision-making. ASTEC is a membership-based network of about 700 science and technology centers and museums. So our program focused on the public part of public interest technology and on boundary organizations that work to engage them in science and technology society issues. Why? Because there is a growing demand uh, placed on these institutions to be the educators, translators, conveners, facilitators, and bridge builders between the lay public and decision makers on complex socio-technical issues uh, from artificial intelligence to gene editing to climate change. So our, the project's goal was to create a replicable, scalable, and competitive fellowship program where museum professionals could work collaboratively with a civic government or university partner to co-create and convene a public forum on a pit issues of interest to their communities. So we selected and trained 10 fellows in five communities. So in Ann Arbor, Jade Marks at the Museum of Natural History worked with Justin Shell of Shapiro Design to create a community forum on environmental justice. In San Jose, Anya Scholz of Tech Interactive and Corinne Takara uh, worked together uh, to create a forum on ag tech, biotech, and food. In Worcester, uh, Rachel Kunby of Ecotarium and Stephanie from the city of Worcester created a, a forum on reducing urban heat island effect. And in Waco, Texas, Cindy Millard and Mayburn from the Mayburn Museum and Melissa Mullins created a forum on water challenges and climate resilience. Finally, at LA, uh, Sasha Buris of Discovery Cube and Rebecca Fredman from LA County Chief Sustainability Office work on sustainability education. 
Now, because of COVID-19 restrictions, our fellows had to innovate and find online tools platform combined with creative strategies to engage stakeholders and residents in their respective communities. But they all persevered and looking at what they have built in the face of widespread uncertainties, we couldn't be any more proud of them and we are thrilled with the outcomes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mahmoud. Um, next up is um, Margaret Hagen, who is the executive director of the Legal Design Lab and a lecturer in law at Stanford Institute of Design. And her project was Pitt Case Studies Platform. Yes, thanks. So <clears throat> I came to the Pitt UN movement as a lawyer and as a social scientist. I run a lab um, at the law school at Stanford where we work with legal aid groups and courts and city government to work on eviction cases or debt collection cases, family law problems. And we've always been thinking um, how to improve the citizens experience of the justice system and how to leverage technology and data and artificial intelligence to improve the services and people's outcomes when they go through court. So public interest is already a watchword inside the law school community. So it's um, been really great in terms of developing more interest in um, law schools, faculty and students about how to work more interdisciplinarily across campus to leverage all of these other fields um, on problems and policy areas that we as lawyers and people in the justice system care about. Um, the project that I've been working on within the Pitt UN network has been a website, a case study platform in partnership with Georgetown University and Tanina Rostain there at the Georgetown Law Center and Howard University and Noha Hazizi, who's an electro, um, electrical engineering professor. So we have um, student teams in all of our universities who have been scouting around within our university network and beyond to find classes that are being taught on public interest tech, um, themes or projects, and then to uh, student projects um, that have emerged out of them. And we've been drafting case studies and publishing them on the platform. You can go visit uh, our prototype site, pitcases.org. Our goal here is to really spotlight um, how a public interest technology project can best be um, launched within a class and potentially outside of it, spinning out into a new um, venture and how teachers who are thinking about taking kind of a public interest technology lens or teaching a project-based class can put together an effective syllabus, build partnerships with community organizations, and teach and guide students through this process. I've taught several public interest technology style classes, and there's a lot of ups and downs in actually setting up the partnerships and the curriculum. So our goal is that these case studies can both be used inside of classes, so students can wrap their heads around this type of project work and um, in the planning stages for teachers as they're setting up a successful class. So you can see we have about six um, current case studies up there and we're putting more up week to week. Uh, if you have any interest in having any of your classes or projects profiled there, please, um, you, there's a link on the website to, to let us know, but we're really hungry for more examples from teachers and from student groups. Excellent. Yeah, I have a colleague actually that goes to CUNY Law and I told her when I learned about your website, I was, I was very excited and I told her because I know she's interested in public interest tech. Um, so last but not least is uh, Susan Imberman, who is a, a professor of computer science at the College of Staten Island CUNY and actually formerly she was the Associate Dean for Technology Education at Central Office, which is actually how I first met her. Um, and she, her project that she did with um, our um, uh, our OER librarian, Ann Fiddler, is entitled Curricula Design in Public Interest Tech. Please, Susan. Thanks, Abby. Um, so uh, my project was not just done with our OER librarian, it was also done with a number of colleagues across the university. Um, Karen Shelby at Baruch University, she's an artist. Um, Deborah Sturm at College of Staten Island, who's a computer scientist, and Devorah Klatnik, who's also a computer scientist at Brooklyn College. So we started off with a small village and the premise of our project is that it takes a village to create a shared curriculum. So our project was to create a repository of materials that was focused on public interest tech by awarding university-wide faculty mini grants to create and share PIC curricular as an open educational resource. 
And we were essentially crowdsourcing across the CUNY University system. The resources and curriculum that we created were sh are shared through our university repository and via pick group on OER Commons. So we created this pick group on OER Commons. It is open to the public. You're more than welcome to um, link your materials to it. And both of these repositories made the curriculum available for download to anyone who wishes to download it. We've had, um, at the current time, we have about 33 pieces of curriculum up there. When I did my original video, we had 18. So just to show you that we are you know, constantly adding material to that. And since the summer so far, we've had 507 downloads worldwide. So it's been a very interesting project and very um, widespread. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Susan. Um, so we're doing very well. So I, I have to say, I was when I viewed all of your um, your videos, your poster sessions that you did, where you spoke about your projects. One of the things that struck me, and maybe this is just my own inclination, sort of in my background as a political theorist, I'm really interested in the definitional aspect. Like we're still, I think, struggling a little bit with what is public interest tech and how what people what people's understanding of public interest tech is. Um, and, and interestingly, I don't know how many of you attended the, the president's and provost meeting today, but Anne-Marie Slaughter was saying, you know, what's wonderful, there seems idea of what come public interest tech is is gelling and there's the courses being led and we're, you know, creating a program or a discipline or not a program, but a discipline. Um, and the thing that really struck me about the, these four different projects, sort of how they differed, was that Kenneth and Susan's projects, although Kenneth, Kenneth, you said you have a very interdisciplinary background, was that in some ways they were much more sort of grounded in the art traditional sense of like, as you know, as mentioned, one of the other panels, sort of the, the digital understanding of public of technology. Whereas Mahmoud and Margaret's, it really seemed like they were had much sort of a, a broader understanding of technology that you brought to your projects and the people that were engaging with with your projects and particularly my moods i mean it's, it's interesting with you working with the um the museums and the science learning centers i mean this is i guess what nsf calls um sort of uh, stem learning in informal settings and so i guess what my question is having said all of that i guess i'm just wondering of the, the 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 faculty members and the the science educators and the students that you worked with did you get a sense of i mean did you sort of leave the definition of what is public interest technology up to them and let them figure it out through their work or did you have sort of a common understanding of um you know because i mean it's again sort of mood it seemed like there was a very broad i mean the projects that you covered dealt with you know smarter cities to you know water usage to i guess i'm i'm wondering sort of how you're defining technology <laughs> maybe we should we can start with you mahmoud yeah so uh, our actually goal was to find the public interest and i think that's what uh uh, Larry Suskin was uh, talking about in the previous panel, which is, you know, so we actually led the communities, the, our partners, to figure that out by asking the people. So they did an extensive, the first phase was, you know, the topic development. So they engage with the stakeholders and experts in their communities to say if it's water, okay, that's what I want, but what's the issue in water I want to particularly focus on? And then they developed the program, a set of questions, and then they brought in the public for the dialogue. So that's how it was, you know, to find what's the public interest. So normally, because we're coming at this from that recognizing there's a, you know, a public value failure when we fail to incorporate the public. And, and what is that? And we think that the best people to answer that question is the public themselves. So, so instead of you know, us academics trying to figure it out uh, by studying lit review and, and doing all the things we do, this was a, an exploratory in that sense. Does that kind of address? Yeah, 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 absolutely. So Margaret, do you have any thoughts on sort of what was the, the technology that you were bringing to the public interest technology? <laughs> Yes. Well, I think because our project focused so explicitly on kind of courses and projects, student projects that were already out there, we were interrogating like what classes actually identify in this public interest tech sphere. And I would say the general pattern that we see in terms of courses are 
a public interest partner, meaning either a government agency or a nonprofit who is acting with a mission in the public interest, then coming to a university um, class partner and saying, how do we fix this problem? How do we kind of solve this um, gap, um, usually with the idea that technology is the solution. So as we saw more case studies come in, yes, oftentimes the, the projects that come out of these public interest tech classes are data driven or artificial intelligence or new text messaging system, but not always. Sorry, I have a kindergartner interrupting me. Can I take a break? Oh, of course. So Ken, what do you, so what, um, what sort of uh, projects and discussions came out of the conference that you had in terms of sort of, I guess, um, you know, con uh, converging on a, a definition for public interest tech? Yeah, thank you, Effie. So it was, I mean, very broad reaching. So um, we largely left it up to the participants in terms of we laid out public interest technology as we understood it from the New America website and from our involvement in the first convening. Um, but, you know, I think that we're still building uh, the whole concept of public interest technology and, and Pit UN is, is, you know, in this really exciting growth phase. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity and opening there. Um, for us in a school of information, we're an inherently interdisciplinary unit. Hmm. So um, we're not a discipline, we're a wide range, I believe, um, we're, we're rapidly expanding in the ET Austin School of Information with the launch of the undergraduate major. So this number will be dramatically different in a few years. Um, but last time we looked at this a few years ago, we had about low 20s faculty and we had at least 10 different PhD fields across the faculty. So you won't typically find that in a CS department or an engineering department or in a core social science or humanities department. Um, so, I mean, there were, you know, uh, I would say a third of the people who attended were at Pitt UN universities who were learning about informatics in high schools. Oh. About a third were from informatics in high schools learning about Pitt UN, and a third were kind of wild cards. Um, so we had quite a mixture. And when I heard the original idea of Pitt UN and of public interest technology, it sort of struck me immediately as how much it resonated with what we're already doing in schools of information. So in some ways, I almost, my reaction is part of the reason we need public interest technology is because not every university has a school of information. Um, I'm not sure, I mean, I think that definitely there is value in each of the different concepts, but there's a lot of convergence and it would be great to see the public interest technology university network and the iSchools coordinate in terms of thinking about how the brand of interdisciplinarity and of using technology to serve people to do user-centered technology leverage data, information, and technology to, to serve the public interest. Um, and to, uh, you know, not, you know, when you just say, well, here's some problem, we'll add technology to solve it. In a lot of cases, it's going to exacerbate existing inequalities in society. In some cases, it's even gonna create new inequalities in society. And our approach is quite the opposite. We want to figure out ways that we can uh, use information technology that is people-centered, that's social justice-oriented to uh, make sure that we have a more just and um, where we have, we have equity and justice and liberation in society. Great. Uh, so Susan, I noticed when I was looking at your project, I noticed that you had I mean, you funded the faculty projects that you funded were all the way from, you know, creating a module in, into from an existing course all the way to creating a whole new course and also working. One of the, the larger grants was for faculty working across uh, disciplines, you know, humanities and social science and, and um, STEM disciplines. How did what did you find in terms of how the faculty across the different disciplines approach the idea, of, you know, approach the concept of public interest tech? Um, so. Basically, we did not define public interest tech per se. What we did was we offered the various definitions like from the Ford um, site and from New America and from the Heinz School also had a lot of good um, information exactly how you could frame it. But the bottom line was we told everybody it's a nation field. There is no real definition. And we are the ones who are defining it yeah. as we go along. And, and that's why we felt that in OER was a good way to go because as defining this 
nation field of Pitt, we're going to um, take whatever curriculum and resources that we've already built and build upon them and share what we've done to you know, extend what has been done already. And I think that's where that there the power is, is that we're, we're still in the, in the weeds right now. We're still trying to figure out exactly what Pitt is. And um, we did a training and I kind of boiled it down to two phrases. We do good and we do no harm. And I think around those two ideas, um, we can expand upon the idea of what Pitt is. Great, thank you. So I want to encourage um, everyone to, um, if, for all the participants in this session, you know, please, if you have any questions, uh, share them in the chat. You can put your questions in the chat as we go along, and we hope to leave um, a good amount of time at the end to get to any of your questions. And we have very able um, technical support people that are going to be making sure that we don't lose anything. Um, so I guess one of my other questions is about, um, I know that many of you talked about sort of outcomes in your in your videos, but I'm wondering, um, actually, Mahmoud, you were very sort of explicit in terms of the outcomes that you were measuring. But I guess even in a more general sense, um, how do you um, how are you measuring the outcomes? How are you measuring the success of these? And then I guess also uh, to the extent that if you you see um, you know, what's the next step? Where do you, are you thinking about scaling up? Are you thinking about transferring to other contexts, other schools, other, um, you know, other populations in terms of outre outreach outside of the, the academy, which many of you are already doing. So um, why don't I start with you, Ken, this time? So what are you thinking about in terms of next steps for uh, this project? Uh, yes, thank you, Effie. So yes, and, and this, I mean, the collaboration that we have with uh, between UT Austin School of Information, Houston Tilson University, um, Measure Capacity Catalyst and the City of Austin emerged organically from the conference. Um, the feedback overall was extremely positive about the conference. I think a lot of people had a great experience, learned a lot, met a lot of great folks, did some good networking, saw some educational approaches that was part of in, you know, in launching our informatics major that will start accepting students for fall 2021 we wanted to make sure that our faculty were interacting with folks who had vast experience uh teaching undergraduate students specifically teaching undergraduate students in terms of how to leverage data information and technology to serve the public interest which is a huge focus for our high school and for the informatics major um so uh that that naturally uh led from workshops that uh that we had at the conference that combined different stakeholders across the city of Austin just seemed like in the COVID moment a really exciting opportunity to just focus on how we could turn the city of Austin into a model of how multiple universities, multiple nonprofits, and city government could collaborate together. Um, academics alone can't solve all the world's problems. Um, and I think this is uh, similar to Mahmoud's approach that. We, you know, we didn't come in saying we know everything. Um, definitely, there's a whole lot that academics can learn from our community partners and from government agencies that have a much uh, richer sense of what actually can be done and needs to be done in the world. And we're much more powerful together than we would be uh, in isolation. Great, thank you. So Margaret, what about it for you in terms of just, I, mean, I know you wanna get more cases for the website, but what, what do you see sort of um, more sort of long-term would be the, the beneficial outcome from your project? Well, I think as the network, as this Pitt UN network um, really solidifies and grows, our goal is that the case studies and the resources can be integrated into it. I think, um, yeah, that the leaders of the network are also quite interested in having this rich set of content and resources, guides, examples, um, uh, there as a central resource. So we're talking with um, the leadership about how we might fold in all of the materials that we've been assembling um, into their kind of central website. And also how we set up a pretty um, uh, user-friendly protocol to capture all of this knowledge that comes out of disparate classes, um, programming events, because um, we know uh, it's really hard oftentimes in some universities to get a new Pitt 
uh, oriented project off the ground or to help a teacher who's taught in a certain way to um, all of a sudden teach this new type of class and start community partnerships grade and evaluate these kind of projects or even know how to support students during the class or afterwards so our hope is that as we build more examples and more content, we can um, have very well structured guidance for these future teachers and future students in this space. Great. Um, so, Susan, what do you see in terms of? I, I know that. I mean, I also have. Um, I'm a huge advocate of the OER work as well, and as you know, I've. <laughs> <laughs> done a lot of work with the library in terms of um, building out the op open educational resources initiatives at CUNY. But I, I'm I'm wondering sort of how do you see, where do you see um, going forward in terms of building out your OER website? I mean, and I guess also maybe the, I don't know, like future intersections or the, con the ongoing conversation between OER and PIT, sort of where do you see that headed? So, well, going forward, um, I'm hoping to get more people to contribute to that PIT website at OER Commons. Um, be great to link some case studies up there also. <laughs> be great. Um, plus one there. <laughs> and, um, and also, in the process of getting all these faculty together to do their grants, we had trainings together. We actually formed a, a kind of community. It was a kind of um, a very holistic type of experience. So that the faculty members themselves were looking and talking to each other and seeing that there were some synergistic, you know, relationships that they could um, leverage. Uh, and so I think that um, in addition to that, faculty have said to me, "Do you know I, I did this? But I want to go on and extend what I've done." And um, like so there are people who created a module for a course and that wanted to revamp an entire course or they saw that there was some interdisciplinary um, action that they can take within their institution so that they can have some hybrid maybe type of interdisciplinary minor created so there's a lot of avenues that we can go along in order to extend and expand great thank you so Mahmoud, I'm wondering, I mean, as I said, you actually had very good outcomes data in your presentation, if anyone gets a chance to watch it. But I, I guess I'm, what I'm sort of curious, so I don't know if you were able to sit in on the, the presidents and provost panels today when, when um, Eric Schmidt and uh, Darren Walker from the Ford Foundation, formerly from Google spoke, but they all spoke very strongly about the importance of you know universities and universities as the platform for driving innovation and driving you know making real societal change and i guess i'm wondering from your perspective as somebody that works uh, much more uh closely or works much more directly with these um um with the you know these community groups and these sort of public um you know science literacy groups and museum groups and public science groups i guess i'm wondering what what do you see as like the, the, the feedback loop or the synchronicity between what universities are doing and what these, these public science organizations are doing and how can they support each other? Uh, well, uh, you know, one of the, uh, when we, in, in our, um, the, when our grant was reviewed, one of the things question that was asked of us is how are you gonna work with the other network universities? you know, because yeah. you are going to work with the museums and the communities. And, and we, we did try to uh, open it up to engage with the other universities. Uh, one of the challenges that we found was more like cultural, because this idea of, you know, directly engaging with the public uh, is, 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 is most universities or educators often come at this from a deficit sense, like public needs to know some information. And if they know that information, they're gonna do what we are recommending them to do. So it, it be, so there is kind of a, uh, I feel like although we, we work the part with the working with the museums and community organizations worked very well, but I think we need to do some kind of cultural or educational exposure about what is it to actually work with the community? What is it to actually listen and not go there to say, oh, you need to know this and I have an answer because that this co-development process. So I think that, you know, the demand side of it is there. The supply side from the university, we need to do some work on 
to sort of train faculty, train postdocs, you know, in kind of how do you kind of do this bridge building engagement? That would be uh, as something that I would think would be important to do. I muted myself, sorry, right. <laughs> um, so I guess interesting, I was at a, a governance subcommittee. I, it, it, I mean, I guess some of these uh, meetings that we've uh, been in or um, panels and committees, they sort of address the COVID-19 thing, the, the quarantine thing head on. And then other times it seems like we sort of dance around at it and it's like, oh, look, we're in this virtual conference and everything is fine. And here we all just talking to each other, just like normal. But I guess I am interested, I mean, I mean, I guess in some respects, I can sort of see the very direct importance and impact of say OER, because that directly you know, impacts how we teach and, and our pedagogy. And, um, but I guess I would like to hear from each of you, one, how your um, project itself adapted to our greatly changed circumstances. And also, again, sort of the, the, the future question in terms of, um, I don't know, responding to this and learning from it. Like, what are you gonna learn from this experience going forward in terms of how you continue to think about Pitt and continue to think about these projects? I'm gonna start with you, my, Margaret, because you're shaking your head. <laughs> because you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, well, I would say in the short term, um, you know, our project is still of case studies is going full steam ahead. We didn't necessarily need that much in person to get it done, though everything has slowed down in terms of responsiveness and people's schedules. So that's a real thing, um, the COVID related delays. I would say though, at the, the bigger question, if our project is really motivated on how do we teach public interest technology and give students really good methodologies to do participatory design, technology development, ethical reviews, all of these things, it's we don't really have that many good models for doing much of this work that depends on hands-on collaborative in-person trainings in a more virtual uh, world. So we're really interested if anyone out there has models. I know in my classes, we've been trying out virtual design workshops, virtual user interviews, all of these kind of new methodologies um, where before we were really reliant on in-person convenings and all of this good participatory interactive um, kind of reckoning with uh, technology's consequences or advantages. We're losing a lot of that in the digital sphere. So now we're really hungry to do some of that initial evaluation of how some of these uh, COVID um, versions of technology and project-based classes are going and how we can start to define some best practices for those. Oh, Effie, you're muted, I think. Uh, sorry, am I, you can hear me. Okay. Um, so Susan, I, you know that I'm very interested in, in OER and how it's impacting our pedagogy and how we teach and how we, you know, approach education and learning. And, and I'm wondering how you think, I mean, it seems like, uh, you know, the, the COVID-19 crisis has brought into high relief sort of the importance of the development of these OER materials. And I'm just wondering how, if, if at all, that, you know, this period or thinking about this period has impacted how you think about your work and your project. So, um, so I, I'm going to relate this to, to, to one other project that I've done in OER and the current project. So um, one of the projects that we've done that sort of preceded the one that I'm doing for Pitt and sort of informed it was that we, as part of CUNY's, um, one of the init initiatives that we have with the city is that we bring industry professionals into the classroom to give a industry focused class. And part of the requirements of these industry people, these poor guys, is that we require that they share whatever materials that they use in the classroom as OER. And this way other people can see how industry is working. And um, according to my, one of my colleagues that who was watching all the um, downloads, as soon as COVID hit, the number of downloads increased significantly. Mm. We're out there looking for materials in order to use in their online classes, especially PowerPoints and um, and uh, homework assignments and lab assignments. These these were you know we were we were hungry, and and to that end, because everything you know, especially CUNY, we we had it like we flipped on a dime to online learning. Many of the faculty that were working on projects for me 
became their workload increased exponentially. Yeah. It's hard to imagine that it does just by you know going online versus face to face, but when you're online, it tends the the content seems to go faster and therefore you have to prepare more content. And it's definitely just a, a and the way that you assign homeworks and do projects definitely changes. So a lot of our faculty were a bit overwhelmed. A couple of them, you know, rescinded their awards. They said they just Aww. didn't have any time. I know. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then a lot of them just said, well, we just need some more time. We just want to hit the summer and just be able to focus on this without having to worry about the classes. And um, uh, New America was very gracious and allowed us to do an extension until December of this year. So we're, we're still not finished. So um, yeah, so it definitely affected us in a lot of ways, but it's definitely in terms of being useful for a community or an academic community at large, the, the OER that we already have up there was certainly utilized by many, many people. That's great. Now you know I mute myself. I have a tendency to make noises the entire time when people are talking, <laughs> which is not, it's not a good thing at Zoom because you can't have two voices at the same time. Um, so Ken, so how, had, how did the COVID-19 crisis, I know that you talked a little bit about how it felt like the, you know, the pace of everything was speeded up and you had to have, you had the conference right before sort of the whole shutdown, but how do you see, um, you know, the thinking about the COVID-19 crisis and the shutdown and all of that impacting the, the work that you do with your project? Yeah, I mean, to be honest, Effie, most of it was just dumb luck from the standpoint <laughs> that we had scheduled that. I mean, the conference center had a very limited number of dates. Um, we were given options in January, February, March, and April. The April one was right before Kai in Hawaii, which didn't happen. Of course, it got completely canceled. Um, but that was the reason why we we uh, instead picked the March date. Um, we didn't have a lot of time. To be honest, part of our original thinking of um, doing it in the you know spring semester was um, avoiding the heat of you know Texas in the summer. Um, but then you know there became a, a very different reason why it wasn't possible to hold a conference in the summer. So, um, and we had um, 20 uh, fellowship winners who uh, flew in uh, courtesy of the, the generous funding from Pitt UN that we were able to award, um, which was um, junior faculty or students or postdocs and who were affiliated with uh, minorities, many of whom were affiliated with minority serving institutions or um, were members of groups that were underrepresented in, in Pitt. Um, so it's great to be able to have a broad representation of participation across the conference. So, I mean, it was actually made it more memorable for many of us because it became the last in-person conference that many of us will attend for a bit, um, certainly have to this point, and we didn't have to figure out how to do a virtual conference, uh, which I can appreciate as a major challenge, even pulling off an in-person conference with just a few months lead time was, was challenging enough. Um, but it, yeah, again, it made us in terms of our next steps made us think, I think the COVID moment makes you think about what's most important and what kind of collaborations are most essential in this moment. And I think that really did for us sort of lead to this idea, let's build a citywide collaboration and, um, you know, start something here in Austin, Texas, and then expand it out to the country and the world. Right. Um, well, we're, we're at the point where we're almost supposed to take questions from the audience, but Mahmoud, I do want to hear from you. I'm particularly interested, too, I guess, working with a lot of these cultural and public institutions, I mean, with your partner, Aztec, your partner, I mean, it seems like, hasn't there been a huge crisis in terms of funding? And I mean, I'm just wondering what's, how the, the COVID crisis has impacted even, I don't know, the existence of some of these institutions that are your primary partners. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, just in addition to thinking about how COVID has impacted your project. No, that, that's, that's exactly right, because it was an existential crisis. So, uh, and our, our program was uh, spread out the whole year, you know, so we just finished our training and now we are going to train them how to build a forum and they were going to do them in summer and that just, you know, obviously was not possible. And, uh, and some of, and all the museums shut down. Yeah. Some of them were, some of the people were furloughed. Luckily, you know, one, but all of our fellows made the, survived the first wave. Some of them didn't, the more recent ones. So, but what happened was that one, they wanted to keep on going. 
They said, we want you. So we actually kept our training schedule, the webinars. We just uh, pushed out the actual forum convening part to the fall. And what also happened, which is what I think was, you know, Ken talked about miracle or uh, and something like that. So was the transformation that happened? They became the innovators. The idea was that we were going to teach them how to do this, but when they had the challenge that they went and worked with the tech, tech platforms and everybody came up with a very different, unique design. And some of them, I, I will encourage you to go and visit what they created. This, this was quite remarkable using synchronous, asynchronous, you know, and hybrid kind of environment. So it pushed them to actually do something more than what we originally planned for. And I feel like we have stress tested this program so I think, you know, if things become more normal, because our, our fallback position is face-to-face -face is very important. You know, when you sit down with a person, you share a meal, you hang out together, that's very different than what you can do in online. But, you know, if we can go back to that and use some of the learning, we can make a more enhanced and uh, engaging uh, uh, opportunity for citizens and decision makers to come together and deliberate. So. Thank you, yeah. Um, so I do not see, I have a, a question sheet. Am, uh, Mark, is there other questions that are coming in from the audience uh, that we can respond to? Because we're in the question answer period. Oh, oh there's no questions so far. <laughs> You've answered all of their questions. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess um, the one, I mean, sort of the one question that I did have for both of you, I mean, we, we're going to do, we're going to do a little bit of a wrap up in a few minutes, but um, I guess um, I would be interested to find out for those of you that did more sort of like the, the mini grant type um, uh, or, you know, conference and mini grant type things, what were the criteria that you used to select your, the, the people that participated in your project? So Susan, what, in terms of picking the faculty in the projects, how did you, how did you choose who was going to get the grants and do this? Well, we, we looked at whether the proposals connected pit with the discipline that they were actually in. Ah. And um, in our RFP, we also requested that the faculty give us a timeline for when they were going to implement the curriculum. It was not just enough that they're going to give us a curriculum as in terms of um, a resource, but we wanted them to implement it in the classroom. And they were also required to give us a budget as to how they're going to use the funds that we gave them. And we made our decisions based on whether these three criteria made sense in terms of the proposal. Um, we also tried to make sure that we funded proposals that covered a representative cohort with respect to full-time faculty versus adjunct faculty, um, community college and senior colleges, as well as looking for a geographic diversity within New York City. Great. And Ken, I know you talked about, I was a little bit, so the, the, the conference itself, you said there were 100 participants from 30 colleges, but then there were 10 um, specific um, awardees so who who were the 10 and i know that you said that you tried to be you know select a diverse group but i'm i'm curious i wasn't entirely clear on who who the actual actual cohort of the 10 uh grant sort of mini grant recipients were uh, yes Effie, i believe it was 20 although there may have oh, been okay. one or two i had to cancel due to, to oh, okay. COVID. but um it was either 18 or 19 of the 20 awarded were still able to make it despite the unusual pandemic pre you know it's just on the cusp of the pandemic circumstances. Um, and so the three criteria that well, okay, so first we um, participants submitted um, abstracts for it could be a paper or a panel or a poster. And so we reviewed those first. We were uh, looking for um, relevance to public interest technology. We were looking for um, relevance to the field of informatics broadly conceived which again at us at the UT Austin School of Information our approach to um to informatics is very broad and interdisciplinary so we had a lot of social scientists there we had a lot of computer scientists there as well as folks in i schools and, and other units um as biologists and, and engineers and and lawyers so wide range of, of different folks 
and, and certainly representation was one of the considerations. So our view of excellence is that it has to include broad representation as part of that. You're never going to get the best ideas by looking at a very narrow cross section of, of, of participants and you want to have everyone's ideas at the table. You'll have much richer ideas as a result. Um, and then once we had done that pass, then we reviewed, we also had uh, the, uh, only some people applied for the travel uh, fellowship. So many, you know, if someone was a full professor, we had a, uh, a director of a school come and uh, so they're able to pay their own way through their, uh, their travel funds. So we prioritized to folks who wouldn't have travel funds or wouldn't have sufficient travel funds. So the three criteria that we used were prioritizing junior over senior. So we're focusing on um, students. We had undergraduate, masters, and doctoral students present and, and, and presenting. We had some fabulous undergraduates from Olin College of Engineering um, who presented the conference, which was phenomenal. Um, it was a conference on undergraduate education, so it was great to have undergrads who are the actual consumers of the of the product there to tell us what we could be doing better and also perhaps thinking ahead to their careers as potential future uh, educators. And uh, we had postdocs and some junior faculty. And then we focused on uh, minority serving institutions. So um, we had uh, participants from uh, four HSIs and from two HBCUs. Um, and that was, you know, certainly funding is, is useful in the context that, I mean, whether you're talking about a minority serving institution or a community college that, I mean, every institution has different resources, unfortunately. So it's important that we make sure that we broad representation, even though not every institution has the same opportunities and resources. That's the benefit of the Pitt UN funding. We also wanted to make sure we had broad representation in terms of lived experience. So um, in terms of, uh, we asked people to describe uh, the extent to which um, they felt represented in, in, in PIT, in STEM, in informatics. And so certainly, uh, you know, one aspect of that is like gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, um, race or ethnicity, uh, disability status, um, first generation college student, you know, a lot of different factors, veteran status that could play into that. But we wanted to have broad representation across our society. And um, we really felt that, uh, I mean, that that did help to really have a breadth of representation and perspectives, which led to much deeper conversations. If everyone had been from the same universities and you know dressed the same and everything, it wouldn't have been an interesting event. It was much more, uh, much richer from the the different lived experiences, the different disciplinary perspectives, the different institution types, which really drives what undergraduate education is like at a liberal arts school compared to a polytechnic compared to an Ivy League school. So we had this broad representation. Yeah, yeah, I saw Q. Yeah, I, I just want to add that I attended that conference and it was- Oh, I was wondering if that was you. <laughs> <laughs> it was great. And, and it, was, it was plus one for that conference. It was, it was, and it was just before the, you know, basically everything hit the fan. And, uh, <laughs> and like the next week we were like, oh my God. <laughs> and it was the last in-person in conference I attended. Yeah. Well, we have just about five minutes left and um, they had asked us to give you a little time to just wrap up, say any parting comments, anything you'd like to say about the conference, about your project, about Pitt UN, about where we're going, where you've been, anything. <laughs> Why don't we start with you, Margaret? <laughs> sure, well, I think, you know, I had come to this project, I thought I was very interdisciplinary um, before I kind of uh, started the case study project. Um, but really, it turns out I had been in my bubble of other law school professors or lab directors and had been thinking of public interest in a kind of very narrow justice um, or law oriented way of thinking and way of teaching my classes. So I really appreciated seeing how public interest tech classes are being taught in public health schools, in um, policy schools and all kinds of other domains. And so I'd really recommend that uh, if you are teaching a class, there's a lot to learn from um, other folks' syllabi and um, coursework, how they structure their partnerships and classes. So um, I'm all for more of this kind of cross-sharing and figuring out, uh, even if we are all interested in public interest tech, the unique variations that that actually takes in different policy domains. 
Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm really interested to see how we develop more of uh, great teaching methods and how we can share them really effectively with each other. I think that's a great place for Mahmoud to come in here too, because it's not only sort of radically interdisciplinary and getting out of your own bubble, but it's also those really important connections between um, you know, non-governmental organizations and, you know, in the public. And, and so, um, Mahmoud, do you have any final thoughts about you'd like to share? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, what it convinced us, first of all, the model works. You know, we brought in somebody from a museum world and brought the, to work with somebody from, say, government or nonprofit or university. And they can co-create something and build that relationship, work five out of five times, you know, so they and, and what we also saw that there's actually a great demand for this and mm -hmm. we need to create the capacity. You know, if you look at post-election or you know, our COVID recovery and so forth. So we need to figure out how to empower these institutions which are kind of at the front line. So universities you know, through Pitt UN, we can actually build, help build those capacity. And now that we have created a model, you know, all of us have different models we can actually then, you know, replicate this and build a social capacity in different levels. So that will be, you know, the long-term goal here. Yeah, it's exciting. Uh, Susan, what do you think? Well, um, I always like the, to quote Katie Comiskey, who's one of the grantees, and this is the other session. Um, she put it quite succinctly: um, OER is pit. Uh, by its very nature, it is a public interest technology. She's also said, by the way, if you own a cell phone, you're a technologist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, we, we could argue on that one, but okay. <laughs> but still, I, I think, you know, I, I think it, it's just what, it's OER def, is defined by Pitt. It is a public interest technology, and it's one that we can um, utilize in our academic curriculum and our syllabi and share. And, I, and I'm just really excited to see the way that people use our um, curriculum that we've provided in addition to case studies um, and how these are revised and, and reworked into even bigger and better um, educational courses and um, curricula going forward. Great. So you've got the last word, Ken. Thanks. So I, I think for us, it was really, Exciting. I mean, part of the strength of Pitt UN, as we see it, is the broad range of colleges and, and universities and schools that are represented at Pitt UN. So just the, the broad representation of, of different institution types. Um, at most, like in iSchools, most iSchools tend to be in large public universities, which are great, but aren't the whole of academia. So the broad range of different uh, different um, academic institutions that was represented and it's led to so many collaborations. So we're already thinking about what UT Austin and Houston Tolson can do together to collaborate. There's an interlocal agreement between the city of Austin and UT Austin that resulted in part from the collaborations that Good Systems UT Grand Challenge and the UT Austin High School have been involved in and bringing in. We're funding seven projects with the city of Austin um, in Good Systems UT Grand Challenge, one of which won the Metro Lab Innovation of the Month Award for July 2020. So there are a lot of opportunities for doing smart city work where it's not just about the tech, it's about how the tech can serve the public interest. Well, thank you so much, all of you. I, I learned a lot. <laughs> um, so are we, Mark, is there something that we need to do to close this out or are we good? What do we do? <laughs> We're good? Okay, well, thanks again so much, all of you. And I think there's a few more events. I hope to attend the, uh, the final celebration event, but I hope to see you all again soon. And it's been a real pleasure hearing about your work. Thanks so much. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you.